Okay, so uh, first of all, let me just say I'm very glad to be here and uh, uh, for the chance to tell you guys about the work that we've been doing most recently, although the work I'm going to describe is really the work of, uh, of many, many, many years. Uh, not really because it involves so much uh, uh, elaborate programming or computation, but really just because it, in order to get the data, it's required many years to acquire uh, the proper data. So uh, uh, what I'm going to describe, though, is, is uh, in essence, a, a very large-scale kind of class of models, or model or class of models. But I'll do it from the point of view of saying that uh, the goal is to, to explain explain data. And so we have to look at what data are, what the data are. So I mean, one, one hope of this, of this presentation is over the next half hour or so is to say that even if you don't like the model I'm going to eventually show, uh, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll le learn something from looking at w what the data are. All right, so can everybody see this okay? So the domain I'm going to talk about today is firms, and everybody knows something about firms. I mean, these things are obviously the important firms are very important to us economically. I mean, all the all the goods we consume, all the the food we eat, et cetera, is uh, made by firms. So to, to to know more about firms is a, is an important social science uh, issue. But uh, it's, uh, when we think about, for those of you particularly who are economists, think about what we do know about firms. What we know is that there are many different theories of why there are firms. Uh, and these theories are in some sense uh, competing. That is, they're not necessarily complementary. They, they don't, they don't uh, work together. They're, they're quite different uh, 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 theories. Uh, in particular, some of these theories, uh, we, we just recently lost in the last, uh, last two weeks, we've lost the great Professor Coase. I mean, some of you will, know, will have read Coase and uh, know that uh, uh, you know, there's, there's not really any uh, deep mathematical theory in, in Coase or Williamson or, or the, these famous, uh, famous writers on the theory of the firm. Uh, in fact, the books read a lot more like philosophy, and they, they use new terminology. They invent things, uh, invent terms uh, uh, that, that seem to be quite localized to to the theory. So the question is, can we can we make the make this theory make it more uh, more like real science? And one way to do that is with data. And so I'm going to talk about today about data, and very important here, uh, the kind of data I'm going to talk about is going to be on the universe of all of all firms. That is, I'm not sure that's why I was doing that. We're gonna, I'm going to talk about data on basically uh, you know, all firms that are, that are in the U.S. Now, where do these d data come from? And it turns out that, um, in the, uh, you know, as many, many governments uh, have, uh, the U.S. has comprehensive data on every firm that pays taxes. Okay, so this is, uh, I should ca put a caveat in here and say this is the data on all the firms that pay taxes in the U.S. Now, the, the uh, Internal Revenue Service of the U.S. Uh, tells me that if, in fact, Anybody knows about any firms that are not paying taxes? They want to know about that. Okay, so uh, uh, this is the universe. This is the, the, the this is the uh, universe of all firms. And what I'm going to basically argue is that th there do not exist today models that that explain these data. So yes, of course, the Coase and Williamson and, and the great uh, writers on the theory of the firm, uh, are, uh, Alshin, who also passed away this past year, and uh, Demsets, and all all, all these uh, well-known uh, writers on the theory of the firm have written theories, but we don't have, have models today which, which explain, the, uh, explain these data. Uh, so what is the most common approach to understanding the firms? And I, I'm going to basically suggest that uh, those of you who come from a business school background, I mean, it's certainly the case that uh, the case study approach is very commonly utilized. Uh, but I'm going to, hopefully by the, by the end of this talk, you'll, you'll feel that there's, there are enough data available that we don't need to use this case study approach anymore, or maybe only to study an individual firm, but certainly not to study whole populations of firms. So the goals of this talk are basically to, uh, to show you what the data are and then build a model which explain the data. Okay, so that's kind of it. Yeah. Okay, uh, but so because it's the data on all American firms, I've called this, you know, it's a, it's a full-scale uh, full scale model. I've got a picture of, uh, you know, a my kid's uh, HO uh, small-scale track and a, and a big race car track. Um, uh, so there are 120 million uh, workers in the U.S. in the private sector. Now, it turns out that the, U the U.S. public sector, that is, those people who work for government, have somewhat different properties than, than the behavior than the people who, who work in the private sector. So we're going to look only at the private sector for now, okay? So just to keep, keep in your head, there are 120 million, million people in that sector. 
There are about six million firms that have employees. So uh, you know, we're going to come to the number a little bit later, but divide uh, 120 by six and you're going to get that the average firm size then is about 20. It's about 20 people in a typical firm. Uh, there are, uh, by many standards, there is an extraordinarily high amount of turnover in these firms. Uh, in the, there's a very famous uh, paper in the Handbook of Labor Economics by a well-known labor economist where, where he says, three million uh, uh, people changing jobs every month is, uh, is kind of is, you know, is, uh, impossibly high. It's, it seems like it's, 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 it's w w way too large. When you think about it, it means that there's going to be something like 35 or 40 million people changing jobs every year out of only 120 million people in the whole economy. Uh, there are 100,000 startups in the U.S. every month. Uh, so th these are just you know, kind of these telescoping numbers from, six million, from 120 million down to 100,000. There are the, the largest 20,000 firms employ half the workforce. Okay, so even though the average firm size is 20, uh, so these are just, just some, well, some calibrations for you guys to get a feel for it. The largest firm in America has a million employees. This is the so-called Walmart, which is the, uh, a large, uh, a large uh, basically re retailing uh, company. Okay, if I want to start out with 120 million agents, so the usual kind of the, you know, the canonical uh, agent-based uh, you know, procedure, just drop 120 million agents into some environment, and I want to get them to do all those things. Okay, I want them to spontaneously organize themselves into, those, into that configuration, 100,000 startups every month, uh, one giant firm, uh, six million firms total. What is a, a specification of the aging behavior of the environment which, which yields us, which, which produces th that outcome? Now, I'm going I'm to assert that I, I, I'm going to show you eventually that there is such a thing. There is, there is a specification that we've kind of, you know, evolved into or stumbled into. Uh, but before we do that, we have to realize, we have to, we have to be able to build models you know, with 120 million agents. So I'm, I'm going to talk primarily today about, about what the data are and, and what the, uh, the social science you know, behind uh, this population of the entire U.S. Uh, uh, firm uh, population is. But uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about how to build models with, uh, with so many agents. All right? Okay. So uh, just a very quick digression about why full-scale models? The most common question I get on this, on this talk is people say, well, if you can do 100, 100 million agents, couldn't you also get just about as much information out of, out of 10 million? Or couldn't you get almost as much if you just had 1 million agents? And of course, the answer is that we, we do full-scale today because we can. Uh, there, are, there, are, there is enough computing power around. Uh, there's enough uh, hardware and software, and I'll get to that in a minute, where it's, 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 it's not hard to do that. So we'll, th this is certainly one... One answer, and I'll also, if we have time, I'll discuss the fact that uh, when we first started this work, we could not do this, and so that that, that posed other problems that we'll, we'll we'll talk about as we go through the through, through the data. Okay, now, as I've talked about uh, the fact that the U.S. government makes available in some reduced form all the tax data, so this is in some sense administratively complete data. Right? This is the data on all firms that pay taxes. Uh, it's uh, obviously incomplete in some meaningful sense. Uh, there's going to be a conference. Uh, Sasha is organizing a conference in a year or two on, uh, on the informal economy. Of course, the informal economy is not represented here. But, uh, but at least from the point of view of, of, uh, of a bu bureaucracy, it's a comprehensive data that are, that are, you know, that are complete. Uh, and, and although we don't have access to the raw data, we have access to kind of uh, you know, regressions that we run on the data and those kinds of things. Uh, one thing I'm going to talk about, I'm going to show you guys the data momentarily here, is I'm going to talk about the fact that um, one thing we're going to try to match in the data are things like volatility, variability, standard deviation. Now, it turns out if you run the model, if you run one of these models at a, at a scale that is not full scale, you immediately confront questions about things like, well, is the volatility I'm seeing in the output, is it due to the fact that I have too few agents? They're not being kind of like, you know, not subject to the law of large numbers. Or, or is it actually the natural variation in the system? And so one thing that you can, we basically avoid by running the model at full scale is we avoid having to, to do complicated scaling on things like the volatility and the variance. And that, that's important, and you'll see that come through here. Now, in the, in the paper that we've written on this, and I'll make the paper available tonight for people who want it, uh, we've also argued that uh, economists uh, have not really bought in so far to this whole, uh, you know, uh, uh, current zeitgeist where people are trying to, in the sciences, or all across the natural sciences, trying to build, you know, build uh, re representations of the thing they study digitally. So biologists are building cell models, uh, neuroscientists are building brain models, right? The, this, whole, uh, this whole idea of trying to build large-scale models uh, is a way to, I think, bring the economists, at least, into the world of, into this modern uh, 
modern world. And the final thing to say, and uh, I think we can never slight the fact that policymakers eventually pay our bills for, uh, for, for funding our research, that if we can get them to, get them in, get them to like the, what we're doing, then, they, then they put, it gives us more opportunity to, to do more of, of what, we, what, we, uh, what, we, what we like to do. So uh, it's good to have the policymakers in your corner. I've just written a couple projects that you've, some of you know about. The, the, whole, the whole Cell project was recently published uh, in the journal called Cell. Uh, the Big Brain Project has been funded by the EU now, I think, in some large, lar large way. Okay, now there are, of course, certain arguments that, get, that, that, that say, I have a, I say you, maybe we don't need full-scale models. I'm just going to discuss a couple of them just to get that out of the way. Uh, we can talk more about it at the, more about it at the end. The famous, the well-known economist, Mrs. Ro Mrs. Joan Robinson, uh, wrote uh, somewhere, and I'm paraphrasing what she wrote, which is longer, but she said that um, uh, the whole point of a model is that it abstracts in some useful way. And if you have a model that's full scale, you know, that's not, it's not obvious that, that you're doing a hell of a lot of abstract, abstraction. But I think that the obvious response to this is that, um, look, it's actually quite costly to build models. If, we, if we, every time we ask a different question, we have to have, do, have a different abstraction, that, that can be quite a large, pro, large process of, of answering all those questions. If we have one model that's, at, at, you know, in essence, kind of, you know, the model or you know, a model which can answer many different questions, then it's just, it's, it has a certain economy to it to, to build the large-scale models. Even though the large-scale model seems in some sense like it's overkill, it's, it's, I think for answer, answering different kinds of questions, it's actually the natural way to think about things. There is also an argument from complexity. Oftentimes I hear this from engineers and physicists. They say uh, a full-scale model uh, is, no, is not more useful than, than the real world is. It is if I want to understand you know, how the economy works, I could just walk out on, onto the streets of Warsaw and, and look around and see how the economy works. Uh, is, is, so is, isn't a full-scale model like that? Well, I think the, the obvious answer here is to say that, well, if I could run the real world at 100 times, real time, I, I could lear, learn a lot about it, right? And uh, so that, that's what we can basically do, uh, you know, computationally. Uh, there are my friends in the SD crowd, uh, MIT in particular, who say, you know, why do uh, all this uh, disaggregation uh, we can just build stock and flow models and learn everything we need to know. And so they, you know, basically, in summary, little is lost by aggregation. I'm going to say nothing is gained by aggregation. I mean, you, and you actually lose a bunch of behavioral detail that you, uh, you care about. So uh, the final one is, uh, is that I, uh, I recently had a referee at a journal tell me, in the social sciences, one-to-one -one is not science. That is, you have to do, you have to have some way to uh, take the complicated world of six billion people and compress it down somehow, otherwise it's not science. I, I, I vehemently disagree with that, and uh, uh, <laughs> that's, that's one answer. Okay, uh, now, but I also am not going to, I'm not going to argue this, that I'm not, I'm, what I'm not saying though today is that we, we have enough information today to build large-scale models of the whole world. I mean, that, this is obviously, a gigantic challenge that not, well, not, none of us will see realized in our lifetimes. We don't have the data to, to build models of the whole world, but there are specific narrow domains uh, where we do have, have the data, and I'm going to show you one of those today. Uh, so I'm not advocating full-scale models for the whole world. I think it's premature to do that. Uh, I think that there are real concerns, you know, in the wake of the Snowden uh, uh, re revelations about uh, privacy, et cetera, that are very meaningful, and uh, I don't want to push them under the rug. Uh, I'm going to show you guys today a model that works in some sense, but it's also not, I'm not going to hang my head on and say it's the only possible model of, of, the, of how firm dynamics, uh, you know, function. Uh, you know, science never tells us, science never gives us necessity. Science always gives us sufficiency, right? Newton's uh, laws are sufficient to explain how the solar system works. They aren't, they, as Einstein showed, they are not necessary, right? They're, yes, there's somehow maybe special cases of more general laws, but uh, we never get necessity. So I think that I'm prepared to believe there are many different kinds of models that, at the, at the micro level. I'm just going to show you today, you know, a, a first one, one of the early ones. So good science, really in good science, you have many different competing explanations, and that's also the case here. And then one th thing people always say to me, they say, isn't this just, uh, you know, uh, aren't you bringing Asimov back to life here? And, and uh, you know, same answer as before. No, no, obviously not. Okay. So what are the data? Now here, here it turns out there's enough data where, in the, in the in of time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just kind of just show you a very selective bit of the data. Uh, if, you, if some people have questions, we can come back to this during the question and answer period. But uh, the, the good news is there is a ton of data about firms at the microscopic level. This is data on, on all firms. And these, here I'm showing you, I think it's six by five, I'm showing you 30 different plots of what, what the data are. 
Uh, I will march through and show you a couple things that I think are, are, the, are, the, are, you know, are key things to, to understanding how firms work. But the, uh, the big picture here is that uh, the eventual model I'm going I'm to show you guys is, is only going to have about a dozen parameters in it. Now, how can I have any chance of explaining, say, 30 uh, detailed data sets when I only have a model with 10 or 12 parameters? And one of the you know, kind of, I think, surprising things of working with these large-scale models that, uh, that I'm learning from just doing it you know, for, you know, for, uh, kind of a novice in this area and figuring out how it works is that once you actually get three or four things to work right, once you get like, you know, uh, several of these things coming out right, well, it's almost by, uh, almost, almost by magic. A bunch of other things turn out right. And so uh, essentially all these things that I'm, I'm going to show here, I'll go into detail on some of them, all these things are going to come out right. What, well, what these are here, the, the, these are plots of how the real world looks. And I'm going to show you in the model, we're going to get all of these things to come out right. Uh, and so uh, let's actually look at a couple of these things. I would say we don't have time to go through all of them. Let's pick out a couple. Um, this is a plot of, uh, how, uh, over time, how many firms are born every year, every month in the U.S.? And it's written in this weird, uh, 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 on the vertical axis, you can't read it, and it's, it's an odd unit. It says it's in what fraction of the American population is involved in either making a new firm or making, or actually hiring, hiring employees into a new firm every, every, into a startup every month. Now, the main thing to say about it is, that, yeah, there's some variability. These are crude data. Um, or kind of annual data, but the main thing, thing to say is that there actually is, a, is a roughly a kind of a constant level of entrepreneurship always happening in the U.S. And it turns out, he, he, I'll get to the number in a minute, but it's hard to read it off here, but roughly in the U.S., every month about 100,000 firms, 100,000 new firms with employees are born. So think about that, 10 to the fifth. Now, in order for it not to be the case that we have a we have, uh, after some long period of time, a bunch of very small firms. It must be the case there's a bunch of firms that are also going out of business that are, that are small. So roughly in some steady state condition, there are about 10 to the fifth new firms being born every month. And those, those are with employees. Now, there's actually a larger number that don't have employees, but I'll, 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 we'll come back to that if we have time at the end. Uh, this is a little bit hard to read probably from where you are, but what the, this shows the flows, the gross flows between employed, unemployed, and out of the labor force I'm not going to deal in this, in this first version of the model with unemployment, which is a different, different phenomenon, more of a macro, macro thing. But I will have in this model um, how many people move from being employed in one month to, to, to changing jobs, still employed but with a different firm. And the number, which is hard to read here, is that about 3 million people, 2.8 million people on average, are changing jobs in the U.S. every month. Now, this is inter-firm job transfer. There's actually, of course, a lot of intra-firm job changing also. But I, so I want to have a model, going back to the previous slide, with 100,000 new firms every month, a model with 3 million people changing jobs uh, every month for reasons that are presumably in their own self-interest. Right? They wouldn't be changing jobs if they weren't. This is hard to read, and I apologize, it's hard to read it. This is my own uh, work on what is the firm size distribution. There's one firm in America with a million employees. That's Walmart, as we discussed. There are a million firms with one employee. And already, uh, you know, a generation ago, Herbert Simon knew that this was roughly the right structure. He didn't have the data. But this is, it turns out this is a Pareto law with slope about one, about minus one, which is also known as a Ziff law. I'm, I'm going to skip a couple of these things. This is a plot of what are, what are the sizes of the largest firms in America. Uh, the the ir irregular line is how unemployment has gone up and down, but the big firms grow, just monotonically grow. Um, what is the dis distribution of firm ages? This is for every firm in America. Now, it is a little bit tricky to compute firm ages when you have mergers and acquisitions going on. You know, you get weird things like um, uh, Hewlett Packard uh, bought digital, but digital had previously bought uh, you know, the Burroughs Adding Machine Company or something, right? So Burroughs goes back to the, to the, to the turn of the, of the 20th century, uh, and HP is a you know, phenomenon of post-World War II. So hard to, hard to date this a little bit, but but uh, at least for the firms that are, say, 20 years age or younger, there are gross regularities here. The different, different, different lines here simply refer to the fact there are, these are, what is the age distribution in different years? But the main thing to say is there's, there's lots of uh, regularity there. Uh, what is the survival probability? How, how, what's the probability firms are going to survive uh, given, given that they're a certain age? Uh, anyway, there's a bunch of these data. I'm going to skip through some of them. This is one that's very important for the economist because it, it actually flies in the face of conventional wisdom. This is now a plot of what does firm growth look like 
Uh, and uh, it simply says that firms on the right-hand side are ones that grow, firms on the left-hand side are firms that don't grow. The average is no growth. But uh, annuals on the left, uh, five years is on the right, uh, it becomes more, some, somewhat more regular, or somewhat more uh, uh, Gaussian as you move to the right, but, uh, but uh, still far, very far from Gaussian. Now, it is conventional to, in, these, in economics to use a Gaussian specification uh, for this. And these, when you look at this, is now data on, on all the firms, and it looks very non-Gaussian. Okay. Um, just move on quickly. I'm going to skip a couple of these things which are more technical. Um, uh, this is, uh, let's see, I'll, I'll, I'll skip that one. Um, what is the, uh, uh, I'll skip that one, better one coming up, job tenure. Wh uh, what is the distribution of, of how long people stay in their jobs in the U.S.? Now here the dots refer to the data and I fit a straight line through it. But this is basically a counter, this, it's a semi-log plot and it's the cumulative distribution. So this is basically showing uh, that there's an exponential distribution of tenure. These are a few people who stay, stay in one job their entire life. And there are, you know, it goes back until that, uh, the, a the average here is something on the order of uh, four years uh, on, on the job. This is a plot which is almost impossible for any conventional neoclassical so-called model in economics to reproduce. This is the plot of firms on the right are growing, firms on the left are shrinking. The black line refers to how much, the dark black line is how much hiring is going on. The light irregular line is how much separation or firing or layoffs are going on. Now the weird thing about this plot is that it shows that even firms that are growing, the black line shows that they're hiring uh, people in addition to how much they're growing. So a firm that grows by 15% is doing more than 15% hiring. Why? Because there are people who are leaving that firm at the same time. So in reality, real firms have, have people are doing both hiring and firing at exactly the same time. Now, in neoclassical models, well, you have you, typically something like, like this. You'll say, here's a model, here's a firm that's, that's, that's engaged in optimal behavior. It, it's, it's, it's a size, it decides it's doing well, so it's going to start hiring people. Or, it's, or it knows that a, it's, it, they have rational managers. The managers figure out they're going to not be doing very well next quarter, so they're going to have a layoff. But you never have, have models where you have simul simultaneous hiring and firing going on. In reality, of course, you do have that. And that's what, the, what this figure says. Anyways, it, uh, now, th this is work of, 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 of my graduate student who just finished named uh, Omar Guerrero. And uh, here we're looking at uh, uh, what is the network through which people change jobs. It is every node here is a firm, and it's a little hard to see the edges, but the edges basically are going to be links between the, the firms. And he's arranged it here in a, in a graph. This is for, now these are, these are data on the entire Finnish economy for 20 years, every firm, every worker. So it's in administratively comprehensive data. And it, it's a very, you know, it, it, it has this very kind of peculiar you know, uh, rings of Saturn-like structure to it. But it turns out that this, this network of who moves between which firm actually has very important structural properties. And uh, it turns out this is something that just kind of drops out of the model I'm going to describe next, okay? Main point to say is that there are, there are a variety of, of data out here, obviously. And uh, uh, we'd like to hit as many of these things as possible. And it is the case that over the past uh, several years, as the paper which, uh, which, uh, which, you know, which uh, describes this model has been progressively uh, turned down at journal after journal because it's, so, it's so unusual, uh, I've been able to, rep to more closely calibrate the model until we, I'm just going to assert now and I'll show you later, that we can, basically get, we can get all these things to come out right now, okay? Uh, and so uh, here, here's, uh, here's some other things that we'll try to hit. I won't talk about them directly here. Okay. Uh, Here's the, the plot that I showed you earlier, but now I've taken away the data and I've, I simply put on a summary, like a one-word summary of what, what we want to hit. And just to, just to give you a sense of, of the things that we're going to try to hit immediately, um, let's, let's, let's deposit 120 million workers into an economic environment. I want them to spontaneously form 6 million firms. So that's going to naturally give me the fact that I have 20 workers per firm on average. Okay. Every month, 100,000, sorry, every month, 300, 300 uh, sorry, that, that's, that, that's wrong, it says 300,000. Every month, 3 million people change jobs, and 100,000 new firms are born. Okay, so the very minimum specification I want to use is one which produces those things. So what I'll, talk, what I'll give you now is, uh, what is, what is a specification? I, what is such a specification? So just to give you some intuition of how it works is, here's a, here's a cartoon for how it works. Okay, we have five firms here. There's 15 or no, 13 employees. Uh, 
at some time, you know, the, uh, agent number six decides he's going to move from that firm to, to that firm. Uh, agent number uh, whatever it is, 10, is going to go over there. These other two guys are going to move over here. 11 is going to shut down firm D completely, it looks like. And so you get this different, different uh, picture here, okay? Why would they want to do that? Well, in, in this model, they're going to find, uh, you know, agent 10 is going to say, I can do better at, at firm B than I'm currently doing at, at firm C, okay? And that's all there is to this model. But now imagine we're going to realize this model now at, uh, you know, at the level of 6 million firms and 120 million individual actors, okay? So the number, number of agencies conserved, number of firms can, can be variable. Here's the model in words. Uh, we'll have a heterogeneous population. We're going to put them in an environment of, of increasing returns to scale. What does it mean? It means that people, can work, people who work together can do more working together than they can as individuals. Uh, and they're going to be very myopic. And this is what economists don't like about this model. They say, well, shouldn't it be the case that when you go to a firm, you think about all of the utility you're going to derive from working at that firm for the next 20 years. You discount uh, all that utility backwards so you get some net present value of your entire future history of working at that firm. And you, and you use that as the basis for, for how, to, how, to, how to decide whether to, which firm to go to. And I say, once again, you've you got to be kidding me. Right? There's no, no way that people can do that. That's impossible. Uh, so there's going to be some way to divide output here. Uh, and finally, we're going to have some social networks that you're going to see how they, how they play out. So here is formally what the model is. Uh, now, once again, this is, I'm going to say this is not the model uh, that, um, now, that we started with. What I'm going to show you basically is a model that works. And uh, so it's, it's going to be very parsimonious. And I'm going to kind of apologize for the fact that it, that it's, uh, that it, that it is so parsimonious. In fact, I'm very uh, cognizant of the fact that we have in the audience today the good Professor Edmonds, who is he's sick of me saying this, but I'm very much a fan of his, of his approach, which says that, uh, or of his perspective, which says that um, merely the fact that a model is minimal does not mean it has deeper explanatory power than something which has, has a little bit more, more complexity. So uh, simplicity in and of itself is, is not, has no explanatory value. But, so what, I, what, I, what I'm basically showing you here is kind of a model where we had to imagine a model that was more complicated. And now we stripped everything out of it that we can. And if you, if you change anything else now, you won't get the results that I'm going to show you, OK? In fact, because I've had almost a decade to, to strip stuff out of this thing, it's probably too much. I probably overfit the damn thing, but uh, that's, that's a different issue. OK, so every, every agent decides how much to contribute to production. The total effort is just going to be ease. Think about effort. It's either effort or it's input or it's, or it's something. You have some skill you're, you're, you're contributing to the firm. And here, this is the increasing returns part is that, um, you know, I can't carry the heavy objects up the stairs, neither can Bogomil, but together we can. So this is the essence of team production. Uh, okay, everybody gets some compensation. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but then there's going to be a relatively standard Cobb-Douglas utility function here, which basically says people like what they get from work. That's the share. They, they, they like the income they get from work. They also like everything that they don't contribute to work. They also like that. And so people are going to be heterogeneous based on how much they like income, yes or no. Now, this is a relatively standard specification. It turns out we know ways to generalize this and to make it a little bit less economistic. Uh, but to, for now, I'm going to do, keep it relatively clean so I can tell you about a theorem that you can prove in, in this world. Every once in a while, agents are going to say, how, how should I adjust my effort level in order to, uh, to improve my, my, my total utility? So here are the formal results, kind of mathematically. You can show that in this team formation game, there always are going to be ways to uh, have a Nash equilibrium. Uh, but the odd thing, the curious thing, is that um, uh, these Nash equilibria, for various reasons of incentive compatibility, are not, not going to be stable. Uh, in particular, uh, for a sufficiently large group, imagine that we're all, we're all working together in one team. Imagine we're, we're in equilibrium. But now suddenly, for whatever reason, Bogomil decides to withdraw a little bit of his input to production. For, he's going to maybe make a new firm or something, I don't know. He's going he's to just uh, perturb the system a little bit. Now the question is, if he adjusts his effort level, will we also then adjust our effort levels and we'll reach a new equilibrium? And the answer is, if our team is big enough, that process will start diverging and become very chaotic and erratic. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, I'll decide to go somewhere else because it's, cause it's just too, it's just too, uh, it's just too, uh, too wacky what's, what's going on inside that firm. So I'm not going to go into the details, but I just uh, describe what, what, the, what the actual co uh, computation looks like. So here are the dozen parameters, uh, roughly speaking, that we're going we're gonna to use to to build the, to write the model down. Once again, 120 million agents. Uh, the a, a, B, and beta, if you can read those things, those are the parameters having to do with, with production. So we're going to have, when firms are born, some of them do have quadratic increasing returns. All of them have some increasing returns, say three halves is the exponent, but they all have some, have some, uh, some measure of this. 
Uh, there's a social network. When you're thinking about where else, your, your firm is not doing too well, where should you go f to look for a job? You have a social network of between two and six people. And you go and ask the people, you say, my firm's going to hell, should I, wh where should, uh, how's your firm doing? And you, you say, my, my firm's doing great, c c come here. Then, then you, so you search your, this social network. About 5% of the agents are going to be active any period. So 5% of 120 million is about, we get about 5 million who are active. We're going to get about 3 million changing jobs. So basically about half the time you're activated to, to, to change, uh, you know, to look at your environment, you decide to change in this particular setup. Uh, we're going to well, the model starts out with everybody, everybody as a singleton. Okay, so uh, the pseudocode is here. I'm not going to go through the details, but basically it just involves instantiate the population, let everybody work, at, work alone initially, you, you use your social network and say, would I be better off working with somebody else, yes or no? And if yes, you go and join their firm. And so instead of looking at, the, at this code, though, I want to show, show you a quick movie, which once again, is a little, it's a kind of a cartoon because it runs really slowly, but uh, the way to read this thing is uh, every horizontal line here, every dot is an agent, every horizontal line is a firm. And what you're seeing are little firms that are kind of growing up. Initially, they were all working as singletons. Little firms grow up. Uh, when, a, when a white hole appears in a firm, it's because somebody has left that firm. Uh, and what you will see here, if we let, let it run for, five, for, a, for a few minutes, we'll see a couple large teams grow, a lot large firms grow. And then uh, basically, uh, it, it is a theorem in this model because, these, because the Nash equilibria are always unstable. It's a theorem that in fact, every, every team has a finite lifetime. So remember, there's a distribution of firm ages and I just, I'm going to assert here, and I'll show you later, that, that we, do, we do get about the right uh, firm age distribution coming out here. Uh, so once we get a firm here's grown up, it's a firm of maybe, maybe, maybe 100 people, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit less. But eventually what's going to happen is it grows up because of the increasing returns of scale. But now people start adjusting the reference levels in that big firm. Uh, some people start, start, in essence, shirking, from us, uh, to use a, a term sometimes used more in sociology than e in economics. And then if enough people start shirking, then the people who really like the income from working in the big firm are going to leave. They're going to go set up another firm. Now, if we were to freeze this thing, and I were to ask you, what is the cross-section of firm size in, in that model at any instant in time? You'll say, well, there's, there's, there's one or two big firms. There's, a lot of, there's, there's more medium-sized firms. But look, there are a whole lot of little firms, size one, size two. And uh, so if we, if we do things like, I'm going to stop this in the, in the interest of time, we can come back and look at it later. If we look at, we just, just ask, well, what are the crudest uh, statistics coming out of that? Well, things, we'll ask things like, you know, what, are, what is the actual firm size distribution? Very quick digression, how do you realize a model like that, with the graphics turned off, of course, uh, with 10 to the 8th agents? Well, it turns out that uh, to a first approximation, if you need to have about a kilobyte per agent, so that every agent is an object, of course, uh, every, uh, if about, about for, at one kilobyte per agent, 10 to the 8th agent means I need to have 10 to the, right, I need to have 10 to the 10th uh, bytes available. Uh, so we need to have a 100 gigabyte of RAM. So you're not, it's not quite a standard machine uh, to, to get that kind of capacity. Uh, here's, but, so here's a bunch of things that I'm just going to tell you, I can tell you a cert now, and yeah, I'll come back to it later if you want to discuss it. What doesn't work? Well, you can't use a traditional kind of scientific, a traditional vector supercomputer of the, the kind that the climate guys or somebody are going to use because what we don't want to do is we don't want to have inter-machine communication because inter-machine communication is just too slow. So what I want to have is I want to have a big, a giant flat memory space, say 100 gig or bigger, and then a bunch of cores operating on that. Now, it turns out, as many of you know, uh, our, our, our models are nat naturally paralyzable, kind of, kind of you know, embarrassingly paralyzable, because we can just put subpopulations running on every, on every core. So, but all these kind of uh, normal parallel things don't work well, because they're about multiple machines, and th that's not what we want to do here. Uh, so what you need is some kind of a yeah, giant flat memory space. If you want to address, a, you know, say, a large memory space, you know, you're, you're not going to be using Windows. Uh, uh, unsurprisingly. Lots of processors, uh, many cores for processor. So for example, so I just, I've written some numbers here. Uh, you, you can buy in the US today, you can buy a 256 gig Unix box with eight of the fastest Intel uh, uh, processors on it. Each one, say, uh, you know, uh, double core or quad core. So between 16 and 32 cores, 256 gig, and all the usual kind of accoutrements, big power supply stuff for about $10,000. Uh, so that, that, that's feasible, and that, that's what I've run, what all the, all, most of these models, I'm, most, most of what I'm going to show you next is run on such a, such a box as that. What it gets you is, 
This model still, it takes about, about a day to get rid of the transient. So you set it out, everybody working alone. After one day, it's reached a semi-stationary state. And then, then you collect data on the thing for a day. And so two days of that runtime, and, and I'm going to show you what, what, what comes out of that, okay? Okay. This is uh, meant to look like the chart of what fraction of people are, are, are making new firms every year. The blue line basically is, uh, sorry, this is uh, job flows, I'm, I apologize. The blue line is basically, this is getting us around uh, 3 million people changing jobs every year, every, every month. Uh, over some long period of time. There's actually something technically called job creation, job destruction. I won't go into the, into the details there, but the uh, economists comp compute that. Uh, some jobs are just turnover, some are newly made. But uh, anyways, the, the blue line is meant to be, it's, it's right around the, 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 three, the three, 3 million per month mark. This is now the number of firms. Now, the number of firms that get created is, is the upper line, right at around 100,000. And then the blue one, are going to be entrance and exits. So we're getting, oh, I'm sorry, the t I said it wrong. The, the, the red and green lines are entrance and exits from the population, and the upper line is how many firms there are. So there are about 6 million firms here, and with 100,000, and this is in log coordinates, uh, startups and, and, and uh, uh, exits. Now it is the case, I did not mention it initially, but it is the case, it's well known to be the case that there's more variability in the exit time series, which is red, than in the entrance time series. Uh, people en enter with new firms in a, some calculated way. They're, they're really forced to exit. Uh, I'm going to not have time to go through everything here, every, all these results. I'm just going to get, skip through them. Here's the distribution of firm size in the model. Uh, and we get things like uh, whether you do firms by, by number of employees or workers, you get, you get basically the right thing. You get the right, the right structure here. Uh, what is the size of the largest firm? We get just about a million. So for the, for the parameterization I just showed you, the upper line shows that there's some variability here, but you're getting firm size right about a million, where the average firm size is down here at 20. Uh, the largest firm come out. This is now largest as a function of how many agents there are in the economy. I'm, I'll skip that. We can come back at the end if there's time. What is the age distribution? Now, the, 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 the solid lines are the real data, and the dots are what come out of the model. Okay, so once again, this model you know, it has been calibrated to, to as, as closely as possible reproduce this. Now, there's more curvature in the real world than there is in, in my, my data, but uh, in my model, but, this, but it's close. This is now what is the histogram of how many firms there are? What is the count of firms? by size and age. This is now the joint distribution of firms by size and age. Now it turns out it, it's, in, it's hard to read it probably, but there's, it's, it's in log, log, not log coordinates. So this is exactly what, what the real data look like. Basically a Pareto distribution on the firm size, exponential on the firm age, and a smooth distribution all, all, all the way down. Uh, this is giving us various moments about the age. I'm going to skip that. This is now the survival probability. So once again, the solid lines of the data, the dots are the model out output. Uh, firm growth rates. This is this non-Gaussian firm growth rate stuff. Now here, disaggregated by different firm sizes. Uh, this is coming out with the right structure, roughly speaking. Uh, I didn't go through this one. I'll skip this one. The main thing to say is that they're, they're, uh, according to a, a variety of, 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 uh, of uh, metrics, we were getting, in essence, all 30 of those things I showed you before coming out right. Growth rate by age. Um, this is this one that I said impossible for the neoclassicals to get. Now, we're, you'll see that we're, our, the model is not you know, perfectly accurate. Uh, the bottom one is what comes out of the model. And notice that it's, uh, we have this kind of convergence up to the amount of, for firms that are growing like, like heck, uh, growing dramatically, they don't do very much, as much hiring as, as they do in the real world. So the real world is more hiring uh, and more termination. But it's qualitatively the, the same structure. Um, job tenure. So at the top is the US data. The bottom one is, is, is what comes out of the model. It's, it's basically it's the same exact uh, distribution coming out. Um, employment, how many people are employed by firm age? I'll skip that, in, I'll skip that one. And here's, the, now onto the, the, the network, the, these, the, the labor flow network. Now up, up in this corner here was Omar's figure for what was the Swedish labor flow network. The, blue, the, in, the inset is the data. The, the, the overt figure is, is what comes out of the model. Uh, for these different, uh, for basically if it's for the degree distribution, for the, for flow, this is the clustering coefficient, which has a very peculiar structure. Uh, the data are a little bit more irregular, but and now this is this weird thing about the assortativity, uh, and that's coming out very close to right to it. Make a long story short, is by a variety of metrics, we're getting the right, the right structure here, uh, and so uh, all the details are in the paper. And anybody who wants the paper, just email me, and I'll, I'll ship you the current version of the paper. Uh, I want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to stop here in a minute. Um, 
suffice it to say that um, all the details about the theorems and the proofs and, and the data sources and things are in the, in the paper. Uh, the paper is, uh, uh, has, an, has a, a, a thick uh, technical appendix on it where you can see uh, all, the, all the details. Uh, so the summary of, of this whole kind of you know, work stream has been that instead of thinking about you know, a Kosian like think about you know, what is you know, the theory of the firm, I think one message I would like to leave with you guys is, is, is that instead of having a theory of one firm, I think it's impossible to understand how one firm works in isolation from, from other firms. So we need to rather have a theory of firms. So instead of a theory of the firm, we have a theory of firms. Uh, this theory is computational, uh, and it's, but it, it is nonetheless a theory because it says the reason why firms exist is because of these increasing returns to scale at the local level. Uh, and then we get these, these, the, these very specific structures at the, at the population level. Pareto firm sizes, exponential job tenure, et cetera, et cetera, all coming out. Uh, we're going to use this microdata to really make the model, uh, you know, kind of, uh, at least to tune it to be more realistic. It has this very high level of job switching. By the way, when it comes to job switching, how, how would it be if you're a neoclassical economist? How would you get job switching into the model? I mean, your firm is in equilibrium. But you solve for equilibrium of your, your model. So how do you get job switching? Well, you have to whack the firm with a hammer. You have to, you have to shock it. And so the only way you can, get neo you can get job switching in the neoclassical model is to, is to add exogenous noise. So uh, guess what uh, kind of noise? If you want to get Pareto firm sizes coming out, guess what kind of a noise neoclassical economists are wont to use in their models? Pareto noise, OK? <laughs> Not very uh, 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 realistic. Main thing to say, and the reason why this, this paper has a very hard time getting, getting published in the top journal is the equilibrium of the model is just not meaningful. At every instant in time, people are changing jobs. There's no steady state at the, at the agent level. So think about what is the entire Nash program of the social sciences? The Nash program solves for the agent level equilibria. What I've shown you here is you can have macroscopic steady states without agent level equilibria. And that is such a radical uh, uh, challenge to the conventional wisdom that um, I don't just get back uh, normal referee reports uh, you know, at, at the page or two length uh, attacking the details of some minutia. I get back eight or 10 page referee reports which, uh, in which the whole approach of age-based modeling is, is vehemently dismissed uh, for, for reasons of ideology. <laughs> Anyways, uh, okay, just a quick, couple quick things to say in kind of in summary is that um, I, I, I've showed you one microeconomic specification that works, but I'm perfectly prepared to believe there are other ones. And I think the role of science now is to uncover what, what those are. Now that we have the data, we, we can go ahead, now that we have the data A and enough computing power B, we can go ahead and explore that. Econometrics. Uh, you know, the person I worked with in graduate school, most closely, uh, Herbert Simon, he was not a big fan of econometrics. He always called them the econometrics mafia, in fact. Uh, and what comes out of this? Uh, well, what comes out of this approach for econometrics? I think there's a very definite, uh, definite uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, belief that, that, that arises that there's no econometric model that you're going to be able to write down and solve and estimate from this non-equilibrium microeconomic micro model, right? You always, in, 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 in econometrics, we actually say, what, is the, what are the first order conditions, uh, solve for the equilibrium, write down the maximum likelihood function, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a role for econometrics still, I think. Given the fact that we can now say every econometric regression on a model of the firm is misspecified, badly, let's actually run the same regressions on our out model output that they run on theirs. If our model is good, we should get the same coefficients because it's equally mis because the regression is equally misspecified in our model as it is on theirs. So uh, there is a role for econometrics, and in fact, I, we've even used a lot of econometrics in, in essence trying to figure out what should the right parameters be of the model. Uh, and then the final thing to say is that um, this model has no, it's, this is not a model of a full economy. There are no prices. There are no goods in this model. There are no wages, really. I mean, the people are, the agents are, agents are being paid wages, but they're not using wages. Uh, can a model of this style be the basis for a true macro model where you have now, uh, you'll complete the economy and the wages we paid back in and the, they'll, they'll, they'll see goods, et cetera. You get a natural price level, et cetera. So that's, in fact, the kind of stuff that I'll be working on over the coming year as I sit on sabbatical at Oxford. And uh, 
So I'll, I think I'll stop here. I'll take questions. There's, I have a couple more slides, but they're, they're just meant to be uh, uh, things for for uh, for uh, uh, for to, to, we, we can go to if there's adequate dis if, 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 if questions come up in the, in the discussion. So thank you. That's right, yep. Uh, so, part of time constraints, what, what are the reasons why you don't, uh, why, why you don't take uh, the severities of different states into account? Uh, different American states. Sure. Uh, So I guess there, uh, yeah, it, is, is, it is not the case. I mean, so, so the, the, most of the, the data which, I, which we use in this, all the firm size growth rate data, that's all tax data. Uh, it is geocoded. Okay, so I, I, it, it, it would be the case that I could uh, potentially get state locations for all the uh, firms. Now, just a, a quick, quick bit of terminology is that uh, it, what I'm calling a firm here is what uh, the tax authorities call an enterprise. And there can be many so-called establishments for enterprise. So, for example, so McDonald's has many different establishments, even though it's one enterprise. Okay. So um, now the tax data, though, are at the enterprise level. So yeah, I mean, you'd have this trouble with of, um, of assigning uh, the state location. So M McDonald's is headquartered in some state, but they have operations in all 50 states. So I'm not sure how to deal with that. But, but that, 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 that's an outlier. I think, in principle, you actually could do, do this kind of analysis at the state level. Um, uh, if you, you know, if you, if you could convince me what, uh, what would be gained by that, we, that's something which could be undertaken, I think. Now, it is the case, and I've not, I've not gone into, uh, into the details about how, we, how, to, how to get these data, but the data are obtained, it turns out, um, over a kind of a multi-year process in, in practice, because uh, you have to, uh, I, I estimate basically re regression for the tax authorities to run, and they, you know, they won't give me the raw data, they'll then return to me the results of the regression. But if, in fact, that regression exposes uh, kind of evidence about individual companies, they, they'll get worried about that. And so they'll, they'll make me, in essence, bend the data to avoid individual company representation. So it turns out when you go to the state level, I mean, so there already are problems at the 50 state level of having the bins be too small and having individual companies in the bins. So that problem would be magnified if you went to the state level, of course. So uh, there are probably some, just some uh, disclosure analysis problems with doing that. But. Oh. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Uh huh. I, that's fine. Okay. Fair enough. I, I put it on here because it turns out it actually is pedagogically useful. So I'll. I'll uh, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's if, 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 if nothing else, when I started the work, if I knew what I would have to go through, I probably wouldn't have even tried the work. So that's another. Okay. For, first thing to say is that some of you will know I've done I've done work in anthropology just a little bit on this paper uh, that appeared in PNAS about the Anasazi, uh, published with ma many co-authors. So it turns out that uh, the first lesson for young scholars is the following. This paper was sent to Nature, and Nature said, sorry, not interested. We're not, we're not even going to review it in Nature. So we, we got into PNAS, National Academy of Sciences, right? And then a, a, a well-known well uh, scientist, Gerald, Jared Diamond, read it in PNAS, and he, he has better ends at Nature than we do. And so it turns out that he actually wrote an article in Nature about our paper that got turned down in Nature. Okay, so first, <laughs> the, 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 so the first thing to say is that um, is that uh, publishing can be very erratic. Okay, that's the first thing. But here's the history of this paper. Okay, so um, I'm, uh, I've heard version zero uh, on a 25 megahertz machine. This gives you the sense of how long ago it was, with about with probably a few megabytes of RAM. Okay, I had a thousand agents running, and but I noticed it was producing skewed firm size, so I immediately sent it to the late Herb Simon. He's passed away, of course, now. And Herb Simon wrote, uh, clearly one can now model firms with agents. This changes the whole ballgame of linking micro and macro in the social sciences. Now, getting that from Herb Simon was quite, a, quite, quite rewarding. Uh, uh, and so I thought, well, I, I must be very close to publication. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. I'm going to send the paper in. Okay, so version one. I get up to 10 to the fourth agents. I, I have no data at this point. No theory. <laughs> and the reviewer says, you know, there's obviously some problem with the model. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah, they're always moving. Why did you stop the movie, movie be, 
Why did you quit recording the movie before it reached equilibrium? <laughs> so then, uh, progressively working on things, and we, at this point, I got the firm size market data. I sent the paper to a well known economics journal, and they said, You have data, you have a model, but you don't have any theory. And ec economists need theory, so we turn it, we're going to turn it down. This is when I sent, then, I sent the, the paper about firm sizes on to science. So it's turned down by the economic journal published in Science. Okay, so that, that's really the story of version two, although Science uh, diminished the content on the, on the agent model itself. Version three here is uh, now there are a million agents, and I have proved this theorem now. So I've started having some theory where all the Nash equilibria are unstable. And the re reviewer says, uh, well, Walmart's got a million, a million agents. You only have a million agents in your whole model. You know, we'll see you later uh, when, you can get the, get, when you can get Walmart happening, okay? <laughs> So what the, this is really just a, just a f fancy way to say, well, you know, well, I don't want to see you again because uh, you know, you're going to have to have a much bigger model and that's not possible computationally. So finally, or well, not finally, t 10 to the 7th agents, uh, we have, now I have growth rate data. And this is, this is the most interesting, I think, re uh, editor, who he wouldn't even send it in to review. And he said, um, you know, he, he, was, he was complaining about the whole setup of the model, even though the model is deeply empirical, right? He says, uh, the paradigm which you're using is not, is not the right one. It's not the one I would use. The first step, obviously, and if you, the first step is to write down the socially efficient allocations of agents to teams. So if, you know, in the, in the world of Dr. Pangloss, I mean, this is it, right? This is, uh, you know, the, the configuration of firms in the world is the socially optimal way that people have assigned their skill to a, to, to a coalition. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And this is just, uh, this, is, this, is, this is ideology. And I won't say which university it's from because it, it has ideology written all over it. The current version is, is, is the one, you, one I've just shown you for. Now it is, you know, it, it's been, uh, this is where I got the comment that one-to-one uh, uh, -one model's not science, okay? And then, but then the good news for all of you in the room though, and you can beat me to this if you, if you will, and I'll say that, uh, you know, that at this premier journal, the editor said, this agent stuff is quite interesting. We should publish one agent-based paper. Okay, just not yours, but. Uh, <laughs> So anyways, the, it, it now sits, uh, it now sits uh, at a different uh, good journal, and uh, we'll see what their excuse that they use. But the point is to not get disheartened at any point in, in time as your paper gets progressively turned down. I will say, in my particular case, it's been, it's been useful to have Herb Simon's uh, retort to always go to if I, if I, get, if I get too de depressed about the, about the publication pro process. And it may be also be the case that uh, I showed you guys the labor flow network stuff of, of a student Guerrero. We try to get that stuff into a good economics journal Without success, we end up going to one of these public, one, one of the open open access journals, PLOS One in that case. And I just have to say, I was very impressed with the PLOS One process, and I think that um, it, at some point it becomes not useful to, to continue this process and to just dump it into the public domain and let it sit there and let the economists make what they will of it. So, thank you for the question. Uh, because we are running out of time, so Rob will be for today for yes. almost whole day, so yep. please. Uh, uh, talk to him directly with other questions and now let's go uh, for a coffee break and uh, uh, let us try starting the next session around five past ten and try to recover the, <laughs> the time during the sessions. Okay, thank you very much. Rob, thank you. Thank you.